الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ والا علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وقل جا الحق و ذاق الباطل ان الباطل کا نظ ہوگا ربش علی صدری و یس علی عمری و حل العدت ملسانی افقا کولی آنریبل تنکو دا کراؤن پرنس آف پولیس ڈاٹو شری ازلان مان دا چیف منسٹر آف پولیس دا رسپیکٹ ڈگنیٹریز and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you it is an honor and a pleasure for me to be back in perlis i was there in this wonderful state of malaysia about one year nine months back in february 2017 And this is my second lecture tour to this wonderful state of Perlis. And it's my honor that the Crown Prince of Perlis has inaugurated the lecture tour of mine. The topic of this evening's talk is, Is Islam the solution to the problems of humanity? Islam comes from the root word salam which means peace it is also derived from the arabic word film which means to submit your will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty god islam in short means peace acquired by submitting your will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty god who is the best who can tell you what is the solution for the problems of humanity and the answer can only be one the creator of the human beings the creator of this world the creator of this universe there is no one better than the creator of humanity who can tell you what is the solution for the problems of humanity The glorious Quran, it is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless, a guide to the erring, an assurance to those in doubt, a solace to the suffering, and a hope to those in despair. This glorious Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of humanity, it has the solution to the problems of humanity. Islam is a religion, it's a deen, it's a way of life which caters to both the spiritual aspect of the human being as well as the physical aspect of the human body. One may ask that how can we prove that the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reply to this question is given in my lecture is the Quran God's word as well as Quran and modern science and inshallah I'll be giving this lecture on the 5th of December at Mepis and that will be the last lecture of my tour so for the reply to this question the proof that Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can listen to my talk, Is the Quran God's Word? or my last lecture of this lecture tour. Many people have a misconception that the glorious Quran was only revealed for the Muslims or the Arabs. In fact, the last and final revelation 
the glorious Quran was not revealed only for the Arabs or the Muslims but it was revealed for the whole of humanity Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 1 we have revealed to thee Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the book so that he may guide the humankind from darkness to light it doesn't say guide only the Muslims or the Arabs but the Quran says that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so that he will guide the whole of humankind from darkness to light Allah repeats the message in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 52 that here is a message for mankind let them take warning therefrom let them know there is one God and let the men of understanding take heed Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 185 Ramadan was the month in which the glorious Quran was revealed as a guidance to humanity as a criteria to judge right from wrong Allah repeats the message in Surah Az-Zumur chapter number 39 verse number 41 that Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him to instruct the whole of humankind not only to instruct the Muslims or the Arabs and our last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs but he was sent for the whole of humanity Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 107 Allah says وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we have sent thee Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him not but as a mercy to all the worlds as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to the whole of humanity Allah repeats the message in Surah Sabah chapter number 34 verse number 28 that we have sent Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but yet most of the human beings do not know so Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was not sent as a messenger only to the Muslims or the Arabs but he was sent as a messenger to the whole of humanity and today it is commonly said in the international media that Islam is the problem for humanity so let us analyze today whether Islam is the solution or the problem for humanity according to an article that came in the Newsweek about 40 years back on 16th of April 1979 that article said that more than 150,000 books were written against Islam in a span of 150 years from 1800 to 1950 and if you divide this 150,000 by the number of days in 150 years you get an average of more than one book written against Islam every day in the span of 150 years and after 9-11 after the attack on the Twin Tower on 11 September we find that this rule and propaganda against Islam the rule and propaganda about Islam in the international media has reached to epidemic levels now on average several books are written every day against Islam Can someone adjust the, there is some feedback coming from the monitor. So you can ask the audio technician to just reduce the one from the television. And today, if any writer wants to become famous, only thing he has to do is write a book against Islam. Whether right or wrong, just write a book against Islam, the person who's unknown will become world famous. And if he's less known, he becomes the top of the world. And all the more reason if a so-called inverted commas Muslim writes a book against Islam, the international media makes him on top of the world. And we have the example of Salman Rushdie. When he wrote the book Satanic Verses against Islam, against Quran, against the Prophet Muhammad, we made him multi-millionaire overnight. He was hardly known by a couple of 
few thousand people. Now, more than a billion people in the world know Salman Rushdie because he wrote a book against Islam. We have several examples. We have the example of Tasima Nasreen from Bangladesh who claims to be a Muslim. When she wrote a book against Islam, Lajja, she too became world famous. She got multiple literally awards all over the world. So if you write a book against Islam, there are high chances that you'll get a literally award. There is virulent propaganda about Islam in the international media, especially in the last couple of decades. And the media uses various strategies to portray that Islam is the problem for humanity. What do they do? They pick up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray in the, in the international media as though they are exemplary Muslims. We have black sheep in every community. They pick up the black sheep amongst the Muslims and portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. If a Muslim does a crime, his name will come in the media and it will say, Abdullah, a Muslim, practicing Muslim, he did so and so crime. If a non-Muslim does a crime, only his name will come without mentioning which religion he belongs to. If you want to judge how good a car is, you don't judge a car based on the driver. Suppose you have the latest model of Mercedes, 600 SEL. Year 2019, and if you put behind a steering wheel a person who does not know how to drive the car, and if he crashes the car, I'm asking the question who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? But naturally, the driver. If you really want to know how good the car is, you have to try and study. What are the specifications of that car? What are the safety measures? Does it have an anti, anti-braking system? How many airbags does it have? What is the efficiency of petrol? What is the pickup? Based on the specification, you will come to know how good the car is. And if you really want to test drive the car, put behind the steering wheel an expert driver and then you will come to know how good the car is. So don't judge Islam by looking at the Muslims. Judge Islam by its authentic sources, the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith of the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. If you really want to test drive the car, you really want to know how good Islam is, then we have to observe the life of the best exemplary Muslim in the world and that is the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him if you study and analyze the life of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him there is no human being on the face of this earth whose sira whose life has been recorded with so much accuracy like the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and if you study his life you'll understand that he was the best exemplary human being on the face of the earth. The third strategy used by the media is that they many a times quote the Quranic verses or the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of context. And one famous verse that is commonly used by the critics of Islam is that these critics they say that the glorious Quran in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 says that wherever you find a mushrik, a kafir, a non-muslim you seize him and you kill him, you slay him and if you open the translation of the Quran and you read Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 it does say that wherever you find a mushrik a non-believer, a non-Muslim, you see them and you slay them. But this verse, what they quote, is out of context. For context, 
You have to read a few verses before and a few verses after and you'll come to know in what context is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning these statements in the glorious Quran. And when we read the first few verses of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, it says and it speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, He is giving a warning and He is saying to the Mushriks of Makkah that you put things straight in four months' time, otherwise, a declaration of war. And in this verse, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, Allah says that in the battlefield, wherever you find the non Muslims, seize them and kill them and wait for them in every stratagem of war. So, this verse is revealed in the battlefield. It is telling you whenever the enemies come to attack you, don't get scared. Attack them and kill them. Any army general today to boost up the morale of his soldiers will but naturally say that in the battlefield when you find the enemy, you attack them, you kill them. He will not say when you find the enemy, you run away. So this verse was revealed in the battlefield. When the enemies break the contract and when they come to fight you, don't get scared, fight them and kill them. Can you increase the volume of the speakers? Please? <clears throat> and when you read the books of the critics, one of the staunchest critics in India is Arun Shuri, and he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, he quotes the same verse. Surah Tawba, chapter number 9, verse number 5. And after quoting Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. Now any logical person will realize why we jump from verse number 5 to verse number 7. Because verse number 6 has the answer to a sickness. Verse number 6 of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 says, after saying in verse number 5, that when the enemies come to attack you, fight them, slay them, Verse number six says, six says that when the mushriks, when the enemies, when the non-Muslims, if they seek asylum, don't just give it to them, but escort them to a place of security so that they may hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here the Quran says that if any of the enemies in the battlefield seek asylum, seek peace, don't just grant it to them, but escort them to a place of security so that they may hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which army general today, even if he's very kind, he will not tell his soldiers, maximum will say that if the enemies want peace, let them go. Here Allah says in the Quran that if the enemies want peace, don't just let them go, escort them to a place of security so that they may hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And almost all the verses of the Quran, whenever it talks about fighting, whether in the battlefield or about fighting with enemies, it always says after that, peace is better. Because Islam is a religion of peace, of serenity. The fourth strategy used by the international media is they mistranslate many of the Arabic words to create a negative picture of Islam and one of the most misunderstood and mistranslated word from the Quran is the Arabic word Jihad and it is always translated as holy war. Holy war if you translate into Arabic is Harbu Muqaddasa. If you read the full Quran or any hadith of the Prophet Muhammad nowhere is this Arabic word Harbu Muqaddasa found. So holy war is a mistranslation of the Arabic word Jihad. How did this holy war come? If you read the encyclopedia and history, we come to know that this holy war was first used 
by the Christian crusaders when in the name of Christianity they killed thousands of human beings this word holy war was used by the Christian crusaders and today the Westerners the enemies of Islam are using this to translate the Arabic word jihad the Arabic word jihad does not mean holy war but the Arabic word jihad comes from the root word jihada which means to strive which means to struggle in the Islamic context jihad means to strive and struggle to make the society better if anyone if a student is striving and struggling to pass in his examination we would say in Arabic he's doing jihad in the Islamic context jihad means to strive and struggle to make the society better jihad means to strive and struggle in self-defense jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression jihad basically means to strive and struggle we find many a times the international media they are giving information of Islam which is alien to Islam Islam doesn't say it but the international media twists and turns it to prove that Islam is the problem for humanity and many a times the international media when they say that this portion of Islam is the problem for humanity many a times it is actually the solution for humanity let me give you one or two examples we know today that the Muslims all over the world they are labeled as fundamentalists and they say because of this Muslim fundamentalists humanity is in problem what is the meaning of the English word fundamentalist by definition fundamentalist means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject for example if a person wants to be a good mathematician he should know follow and practice the fundamentals of maths unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths he cannot be a good mathematician for a person to be a good scientist he should know follow and practice the fundamentals of science unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science he cannot be a good scientist you cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush that all are good or all are bad depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist you have to label him accordingly for example if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose profession is to save human lives but natural he is good for the society he is a bane for society on the other hand if you have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob and steal he's bad for the society so depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist you have to label him accordingly you can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist you have to label him accordingly as far as I am concerned I Dr. Lakin Naik say that I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim because I know and I strive to follow the fundamentals of Islam and I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole there may be a few fundamentals of Islam which the non-Muslims may think is against Islam but the moment 
you tell them the logical reason and the logic behind these fundamentals there is not a single human being on the face of the earth which can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity according to the Oxford Dictionary fundamentalist means a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teaching of any religion but when we read the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary there's a side change and it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the teachings of any ancient scripture of any religion especially Islam so the word especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary the moment you hear the word fundamentalist you start thinking of a Muslim that he's a fundamentalist he's a Muslim and the media labels Muslims as extremists and many of us Muslims we go on the defense no 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 I'm not a fundamentalist if you're not a fundamentalist Muslim you cannot be a good Muslim many of us Muslims go on the defense no 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 I'm not an extremist I say I am an extremist Muslim I'm extremely kind I'm extremely merciful I'm extremely generous I'm extremely just I'm extremely honest can anyone tell me what is wrong in being extremely loving extremely generous extremely merciful extremely honest extremely just and Islam says that you should be extremely loving you should be extremely just Islam doesn't say that you be just when it benefits you and if it does not benefit you you become unjust so I'm proud to be an extremist Muslim I follow Islam in its entirety and I am extremist in the right direction you should not be extremist in the wrong direction and Allah says in the Quran enter into Islam wholeheartedly you cannot say that I want to be a Muslim partly you have to become a Muslim completely to be a good practicing Muslim you have to be a fundamentalist Muslim you have to be an extremist Muslim but you should not be a fanatic Muslim Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 171 do not commit excesses in your religion do not be a fanatic but extremist yes you have to follow the Quran completely and the things of the Prophet completely why do you go on the defense why are we Muslims apologetic we have to turn the tables over today the international media they label the Muslims as terrorists what is the meaning of the word terrorist terrorist by definition means a person who terrorizes an innocent human being and we find that many a times two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity by two different groups of people and the best example I can give you is more than 70 years ago when the Britishers were ruling India there were many Indians hundreds and thousands of Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country India these people by the British government they were called as terrorists but we Indians we call these people as freedom fighters as patriots same people same activity but two different labels if you agree with the view of the Britishers that they had the right to rule over India you would surely call these people as terrorists but if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business they had no right to rule India then you would call these people as freedom fighters as patriots same people same activity two different labels and I'm sure you may have several such examples in this country of Malaysia also more than 60 70 years back Malaysia too was ruled by the Britishers 
and there were many Malaysians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. Surely the British government may have called them as terrorists and the Malaysians called them as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And many a times when I had press conferences in India and when the reporter, when the reporter used to ask me, you know, why are we read in the international media, why are the Muslims, you know, most of the terrorists are Muslims. So I asked them the question that the British government more than 70 years back had told that Bhagat Singh was a terrorist. Do you agree with it? They said, no, Bhagat Singh was not a terrorist. He was a freedom fighter. I said, how do you know? We have studied the history of India and we know that the British are lying. So I said, when the Britishers 70 years back told the world that Bhagat Singh was a terrorist, you as an Indian journalist today, what happened 70 years back, you disagree because you did research. Now when the Westerners are saying Muslims are terrorists, have you done research? <laughs> they laugh. Why do you have double standards? And we have several such examples in human history. <clears throat> in the 18th century, when the Britishers were ruling US America, we know of the the American Revolution in 1775 and at that time one of the heroes of the American Revolution was George Washington. By the British government, George Washington was called as terrorist number one in the world. After America gets its freedom, George Washington is made the president of USA. Can you believe terrorist number one of the world becomes the president of USA? How come? Same person, same activity, two different labels. We have several such examples. We know before South Africa, it was ruled by the apartheid white government. And they believed that the white was supreme people. And at that time, they imprisoned Nelson Mandela for about 27 years in Robben Islands. And they called him as terrorist number one. Later on, when South Africa got its freedom, Nelson Mandela was released and he was given the Nobel Prize for Peace. Not that he was bad and he became good. The same person for the same activity when he was called by the white apartheid government as terrorist number one. For a few years later, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine terrorist number one get the Nobel Prize for Peace. So that's the reason. When any person gives any label to any individual, it becomes the duty of us as Muslims to check up whether the information is right or wrong. And for what reason is he given the label? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ujura, chapter number 49, verse number 6, that when you get information, you check it up before you pass it on to another person. We Muslims should not be apologetic. We should turn the tables over. And the international media, very often they say that Islam is an intolerant religion. I say, yes, Islam is an intolerant religion. It is intolerant to those things which the Westerners think, think are good, and we say it is bad for society. Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant to injustice. It's intolerant to corruption, to dishonesty. It's intolerant to racism, to victimization. Islam is intolerant to the evils of society, which the other human beings think it's good for society. Islam is intolerant to alcoholism, to drug addiction. Islam is intolerant to pornography, to prostitution, to fornication, to adultery. Yes, Islam is intolerant to the evils of society and humanity. But Islam is the most tolerant religion overall for humanity. It's only intolerant to those things which are evil for humanity and cause disharmony. 
amongst the human beings. Most of the religions, they speak good things. That you should not rob, that you should not steal, that you should not molest a woman, you should not rape a woman. Most of the religions say this. Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference between Islam and the other religions is that Islam, besides speaking these good things, it shows you a way how to practically achieve that state of goodness. Let me give you a couple of examples. Most of the religions say that it should not steal, you should not rob. Islam says the same. But the difference in Islam is, Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob. In Islam, the third pillar of Islam is zakat. That is every rich adult Muslim who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, every lunar year that Muslim should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity. If every rich human being in the world gives a charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Today, just recently, uh, just a couple of months back, it gave the statistic the wealth of the 10th richest human beings in the world. And it said that the 10 richest human beings in the world have about 25% of the wealth of the world. Only 10 individuals. And the 100 most richest men in the world will be having more than 50% of the wealth of the world. If all the human beings in the world follow the second pillar of Islam of giving zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. After saying that zakat is fard, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop of his or her hand, as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People may say, the non-Muslims will say, chopping of the hands in this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. And they think that every second person you come across in Saudi Arabia where this law is, pro where this law is practiced, they think that every second person will have his hand chopped off. Believe me, I have been going to Saudi Arabia for the past 20 years. I've been there more than 100 times. I have not come across a single person with his hand chopped off. Surely there will be a few, selected few. But it's not as though the non-Muslims think that if you go to Saudi Arabia, every second person's hand will be chopped off. Do you know today, the country which has the maximum crime in the world, the maximum theft, maximum robbery in the world, which country? Can you guess? America, easy. USA, which most of the humans in the world consider to be the most advanced country in the world. Do you know it has the maximum rate of crime and theft in the world? Every second there is a crime taking place in America, according to the statistics of FBI and the Crime Utilization Bureau. Every second. I am asking you a simple question. That if you implement the Sharia, in USA, that every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that wealth every lunar year in charity. And after that, if any man or woman robs, chop off his or her hand. I am asking you the question, will the rate of crime, theft and robbery in USA, will it increase, will it remain the same or will it decrease? Increase, remain the same or decrease? Decrease. You implement the Sharia and you get result. You implement the law of our creator, you get result. And people have a misconception 
that you know in Islam anyone drops chopping hands is very easy it is very difficult if you read the maqasid -e sharia that if a person robs there has to be more than 70 criteria to be fulfilled before the judge can give a punishment of chopping of the hands the maqasid of sharia is not to chop the hand maqasid of sharia the purpose of the sharia is to be as a deterrent allah is the most merciful but allah is also just the reason is not to chop people's hand but the reason is to be as a deterrent so people will not rob so that justice can prevail in the society so most of the cases of robbery and theft the, the judge sees reason to avoid giving the maximum punishment of had therefore if you see where the sharia law is practiced there are very rare cases where this takes place when all the criteria are fulfilled but the deterrent is so much it prevents most of the human beings from robbing unlike in other secular countries there is so many number of theft and robbery because they know they can get away very easily so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our creator knows the best what is the solution for the problems of humanity that's the reason the least rate of robbery and theft in any country in the world it's in Saudi Arabia and previously 30 40 years back if you go to Makkah the gold souk gold market gold shop you know how they used to close the gold shop with just a string or with a just a string to indicate that the shop is closed we are going for salah everything was open millions of dollars of worth of gold is open today if Saudi Arabia relaxes this law robbery will even start in Saudi Arabia it is not that the Saudi police is very intelligent it is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which acts as a deterrent for the injustice of humanity Islam is the solution to the problems of humanity let me give you one more example most of the religions say that you should not molest a woman that you should not rape a woman Islam says the same so what is the difference between Islam and the other religions the difference is Islam besides saying that you should not molest a woman you should not rape a woman it shows you a state where it's possible that women would not be molested women would not be raped if you read the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first speaks about the modesty of the men then speaks about the modesty of the women normally when people talk about hijab 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 they normally talk about the hijab for the women but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman Allah says in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 said the believing man that when any when he looks at a woman and any brazen thought comes he should lower his gaze that means whenever a man looks at a woman and any brazen thought unashamed thought comes in the mind he should lower his gaze one there was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time so I told him brother what are you doing it's not allowed in Islam he told me our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the first glance is permitted the second is prohibited I have not completed half my glance what did the Prophet mean when he said that the first glance is permitted the second is prohibited he did not mean saying that you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying that I have not completed my glance. What the Prophet meant that if you look at a woman, if you look at a woman accidentally, do not stare at her to feast on her beauty. Then the next verse talks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 31, said to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of and to draw a head covering over the bosom except in front of her husband her sons her father and a big list of mehram who she can't marry is given there are basically six criteria for hijab which is mentioned in the quran and the authentic hadith of muslim the first is the extent for the man it's from the navel to the knee for the woman the complete body should be covered the only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the rest some scholars say that even the face should be covered 
The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight so that it reveals the figure. The third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. These are the basic six criteria for hijab. The first, Allah says in the Quran and the Hadith that the men and the women, they should practice hijab. After this, the Islamic Sharia says that if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, he gets death penalty. Non-Muslim said, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, in the 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslim brothers and sisters, when I ask this question to my non-Muslim brothers, that God forbid, if someone rapes your mother, and if the rapist is brought in front of you, and if you are made the judge, what punishment will you give? Believe me, 100% told that we will put him to death. Some went to the extent of saying, we will torture him to death. So when someone rapes your mother, you want to put him to death. Someone rapes somebody else's mother, you say death penalty is a barbaric law. Why these double standards? Why? There was one smart Alex, a smart non-Muslim, and I went to USA. He told me, Dr. Zakhir, I will give him five years of imprisonment if someone raped my mother. So I told him, do you know according to the statistics of USA, the penalty for rape is seven years rigorous imprisonment. I'll come to it later on. But after those people, when they come out of jail, more than 95% commit rape again. So if you want your mother to be raped again, you're most welcome. I would not want that. So he says, if that's the case, I would put him to death. Do you know today, the country which has the maximum rape in the world? Which country? Which country? USA. USA, which is supposed to be the most advanced country in the world, which all over the world they look up to, according to 1990 statistics of FBI report, every day 1,756 rape took place. In the year 1995, according to the statistics of victimization of US Bureau, they said every day, every day, 2,000, more than 2,500 rapes took place. According to the statistics of 2014, every day about 4,000 rapes are taking place. You know, every year the Americans are getting bold. Every 20 second, one rape is taking place in America. We are here for about one and a half hour. For one and a half hour we are here. Since the time we are here, already more than 100 rapes have taken place in USA. From the time we have started this program, Already more than 100 rapes may have taken place in America. I'm asking you the question that if you implement the Sharia in USA, that whenever a man looks at a woman and any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. The woman should wear the proper hijab, complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, death penalty. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? degrees. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason I say that Islam, besides prescribing good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. Islam is the solution to the problems of humanity. Whatever problem you have today, Islam has the solution because it has been prescribed to us by our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. You can, you can keep on giving several examples. Today, the international media, they're maligning Islam by saying, Islam does not give 
right to the woman and they say hijab degrades a woman hijab does not degrade a woman it uplifts a woman the western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body of degradation of honor and deprivation of a soul the western society claiming to uplift the woman has actually degraded her to a status of concubine mistresses and society butterflies which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketeers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture in the name of art and culture they are selling their mothers they are selling their daughters they are selling the women folk we muslims don't want to sell our mothers our sisters and our women and very often you will find that in advertisement to attract the men they use a woman even though the woman is not linked with the product when you want to sell a motorcycle who rides the motorcycle more the men or women well, you will find a woman in that and someone told me about the whim a very famous ad the bmw ad someone told me that in that bmw ad in front of the bmw there was a lady which was standing with a bikini and the ad read test driver now who the girl or the car what are you doing you are selling your daughters you're selling your wives you're selling your mothers we in islam we love our women we love our daughters we love our wives we love our mothers we respect them and we honor them islam has the solution to the problems of humankind when they say we want to liberate the women allah is very clear in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 32 he says come not close to adultery for it's a shameful deed and evil opening other roads to evil adultery is prohibited in islam but in the western society it is common according to a statistics of usa on average an american has eight different sexual partner before he settles down with one after he settles down how many partners there that's not mentioned in the statistics eight some may be having five some may be having 10 some may be having 20 islam has the solution to the problems of humanity how can you have the love in the family when all these open fajash obscenities there that's the reason the international media maligns islam by saying islam does not give rights to the woman but alhamdulillah summa alhamdulillah however much the media is trying to suppress islam that much it is growing according to the statistics which came in the reader digest almanac yearbook in 1984 it gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religion in a span of 50 years from 1934 to 1984 and it said that number one increase in any major religion it was islam 235 percent christianity only 47 percent i want to ask the question which war took place between 1934 and 1984 which forced millions of non-muslims to become to become muslim which war which sword it is the sword of the intellect and after 9 11 it has reached epidemic levels people writing books against islam and the more they're attacking islam you know war on war for peace war for peace it is not war for peace it is war on peace war on religion of peace war on islam it has this guy's form but alhamdulillah in spite of that in spite of the fabrication of the international media against islam in a span of nine months in usa alone after 9 11 after 11th of september 2001 there were 34,000 americans in usa who accepted islam 
according to Johan Redley, in Europe, in a span of one year, more than 50,000 Europeans accepted Islam. The more they are trying to suppress Islam, that much Islam is growing. The international media is saying, Islam is subjugating the women. Do you know, out of those non-Muslims accepting Islam, two-thirds, more than 65% are women. If Islam is subjugating the women, then why are the Westerner women accepting Islam? Why are the American women accepting Islam? Because Islam has the solution to the problems of womankind. Today, the fastest growing religion in USA is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. The fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54. Allah says, Makru makr Allahu wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. The more they are trying to attack Islam, the more they are trying to suppress Islam, that much Islam is growing. Because Islam is the solution to the problems of humankind. I'd like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran, which I started my talk with, of Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, where Allah says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلِ لَكَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Assalamu alaikum to all the audience and especially to my beloved, respected brother, Zakir Naik, Dr. Zakir Naik. It's been a long time since I see you. Last time I used to see you in Penang. Now you are no more for coming to Penang. You know, there are some problems. Okay. But I am from Penang. I come all the way to see you personally with my whole family. They want to see you live. Masha Allah, always watching in TV. Now they want to see you live. Okay, Alhamdulillah. My question is, Masha Allah, the subject today is, Islam is a solution for humanity, but it is very unpleasant that we are seeing in this world today. What is happening in Syria? Muslims killing Muslims. What is happening in Yemen? Muslim killing Muslims. What is happen in, happening in... Uh, they're, they're like Myanmar, yes, we agree. Rohingyans, they have been killed mercilessly. We agree. But there is a solution. Now what are we Muslims are supposed to do? What is going on in Yemen? What is going on in Syria? This helpless man, woman, and children being killed, murdered. What are we Muslims supposed to do all over the world? We Muslims, what we are doing? So, please give a solution that what we are supposed to do, we Muslims. Apart from we making dua, tahajjud, we begging to Allah, and after that, as human beings, what are we supposed to do? Please, my dear brother, give a solution. The brother, the brother asked a very important question, a very relevant question, that today we find that in many of the Muslim countries, we find that there are wars and Muslims are being killed, whether it be Yemen, whether it be Syria, whether it be Rohingya, whether it be Afghanistan, whether it be Iraq, and most of these countries are Muslim countries. What is the solution besides doing dua? Number one, first we have to find out that what is the cause of most of these killings, whether it be in Afghanistan, whether it be in Iraq, whether it be in Rohingya, Burma, whether lately it be in Syria or Yemen, what is the cause? The major cause is, again, the solution is given in the Quran. The cause is that we find that the enemies of Islam, the, my main focus of my talk today was that how the enemies of Islam are trying to malign Islam and how the enemies, enemies of Islam are justifying to attack the Muslim countries. I'll give you one simple example. You know that more than a decade earlier, USA said that Iraq has the weapons of mass destruction. 
and CIA, which is supposed to be one of the most best organization of intelligence, they said that we have got proof that Iraq has got weapons of mass destruction. Not that I'm a fan of Saddam Hussein. I know that he may not be a very good practicing Muslim. But what right does USA have to interfere with Iraq? They together with UK and the other Western countries attacked Iraq. Saying that they had weapons of mass destruction. Last year, according to the report by human rights organization, they said it was a fabricated report. So much so that Tony Blair, the previous Prime Minister of UK, came out in public when he was no longer the Prime Minister. He said, it is the biggest mistake of my life, I'm sorry. You know how many people were killed? More than half a million Iraqis and Muslims were killed because of this fabricated report. And what is the reply? Sorry. What are we Muslims doing? When the non-Muslims enemy attack a Muslim country, we Muslims are sitting on our backside doing nothing. And I think it was yesterday the previous president of USA, W. Bush, at the age of 94, he expired. He was one of the cause for the start of the 9-11. Then followed by attack on Iraq by the next presidents of USA. This, what was the main purpose? Was to get hold of the oil of Iraq. They fabricate a thing and it was shown that they paid 540 million dollars. USA paid 540 million dollars to create a fabricated video to prove that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. 540 million dollars to make a video. We Muslims, what is the fault of the Muslims? We are not united. In Afghanistan, When Afghanistan had a war with Russia, Soviet Union, which was, the, which was the enemy of USA, the USA takes help of the Muslim country, along with Afghanistan, to take out Russia. Hillary Clinton said in a video that they spent eight billion dollars in supporting the Afghanistan and creating Taliban to fight the Russian. They create and then say that they are terrorists. Who is the bigger terrorist? The person who does the act or one who creates the person who makes the person a terrorist? Who is the bigger terrorist? What are we doing? Nothing. They sent clusters bomb in the country which is one of the weakest countries in the world, Afghanistan. They sent cluster bomb. The bomb goes down and then it disintegrates into various bombs, killing thousands, tens of thousands of Ghani. What did the Muslims do? Nothing. The problem is that we Muslims are united. All these what you find, all the war zone, when the Muslims are being killed, who is supporting the killing of the Muslims? Non Muslims. Who's the one who engineered most of the places? You'll find it's a fabricated things created by the news of Islam to attack the Muslim country, whether it be for oil, whether it be for money, whether it be for power, whether to attack or destroy the enemies. So previously, the biggest enemy of the USA before 9-11 was communism, was Russia. So they joined hands with the Muslim countries to take out Russia. The solution to this problem is given in the glorious Quran. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, where Allah says, Wa taseemu bi hablillahi jamia wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we Muslims hold strongly to the rope of Allah and the authentic sayings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we will be on top of the world. If you read the history, before the Quran was revealed, the Arabs were looked down upon. It was called as Jawmil Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. After the Quran was revealed, the Arabs became on top of the world. 
If you read the seerah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulfa Rashidin, and after that, Muslim on top of the world. We rule half the world. And people welcomed us. Come to our country so that we get justice. The non-Muslims invited our Khalifas. Why? Because they wanted the unjust rule of their ruler to end. The Westerners say Islam was spread by the sword. Delisse already gives the reply in his book on page number eight, Islam at the Crossroad, that people who, <laughs> Delisse already said that history makes it clear, history makes it clear that the myth that Islam was spread by the sword is the most absurd, fantastic myth that the historians have ever repeated. It's a myth. At that time, the Muslims were united on the base of Quran and Sunnah. Today, we Muslims are divided. If the Muslim countries, there are more than 50 countries in the world in which majority people living are Muslims. If all the Muslim countries unite, we will be a very strong force. And if we implement the Quran, we will find this is the solution to the problems of humanity. Unfortunately, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that close to the Qiyamah, we will find that Muslims will be in large numbers. And we find today more than 25% of the world population are Muslim. And it's going to increase. But they will be like froth. Froth. Far away from the deen. And we find that today. Muslims are going further and further away from the deen. And this you are finding everywhere in the world. The country that we looked on upon, they are sticking to Quran and Sunnah today, they are going away from Quran and Sunnah. And the more they will go away from Quran and Sunnah, the more we'll be degraded, there'll be more injustice in that country. Now hardly there are countries in the world which we can say are Muslim countries that are following Quran and Sunnah. Hardly. So the problem with us Muslims is that we are not united, we are divided, we fight amongst ourselves. If we are united, today we know that previously Muslims were at least united on the issue of Palestine, today we are divided. There are Muslim countries which are saying no problem that Israel wants to take over the country. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? The problem is today we Muslims fear more the human beings in this world then fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, everyone will be judged according to the capacity you have. Everyone has the capacity to do dua, we should do dua as you mentioned, rightly said. But if someone has the capacity to speak and if he does not speak, Allah will take over his power of speech. If someone has the capacity to fight and he doesn't fight, Allah will take over his power. You know today the Muslims, at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we Muslims were poor. What Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left behind was the Sahaba, was the Khulfa Rashidin. Today, we Muslims are the richest in the world. We have the black gold, we have the oil, we have the petrol, what are we? Nothing. We have been used as domats. Wealth is not required for us to follow Quran and Sunnah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I will not fear for my own ummah poverty as much I will fear the richness and the wealth. Today the problem in us is because we are wealthy, we have forgotten Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Those Muslim countries which have the wealth, those Muslim countries which have the wealth which they can use in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they are using it in the wrong way. I don't have to give examples, the world knows about it. They are using it to bribe the other people, not for the deen. Allah doesn't require us. You and me, the rubbish that we are, Allah does not require us to make his deen prevail. Allah is very clear. And Allah says in the Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah chapter number 48, verse number 29. And Surah Saf chapter number 61 was the man and Allah says, Huwa allazi arthala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq li yudhira wa ala deen kulli That Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms. And Allah says, Da wa kafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah's witness once. And Allah says twice, 
How am I the mushrik don't like it? Allah has given a promise that this deen of Islam will prevail over all the other religions with or without us. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. His deen Allah is sufficient will make it prevail. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit's reward. Allah is giving us the opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. And wallahi, we Muslims are going away and away from Allah and His Rasul. The only solution is we go back to Allah and His Rasul, go back to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, and inshallah you'll find that there will be peace. And the Hadith of Muhammad said that before the world ends, Muslims will rule the full world for seven years. And that would be the best years. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know when that will come. We pray that may Allah make us live to see those tears. So the solution is the Muslims should be united on the basis of Quran and the Sayyidi. Hope that answers the question. Can we move on to the mic behind for the ladies? Yes. Kindly state your name, your profession, and your question briefly. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakin Nai. Uh, my name has to be kept secret for a few reasons, and I hope my face is not recorded. I am a student, and to Dr. Zaki Nai, first of all, I am sorry because you are the person I hated the most a few years back. Before I became a Muslim, I really don't like you, I really hate you, and when any of my friends try to praise you, I will make sure I done great you. So my question to you today is, despite of all this kind of hatred of others towards you, how do you continue doing this da'wah to the entire nation, people and everyone? And one more thing, Dr. Zake. Uh, I would like to sincerely say I'm sorry for all the hatred in the past. Sister asked a very good question. She said that previously in the past she used to hate me and she used to speak against me and anyone who praised me she used to attack them and attack me. And I believe that now she is a Muslim and she's apologizing for that. Sister, first I'd like to say that thank you for giving me all those hatred because when a person truly hates someone and he believes in it but if he's logical inshallah there are chances they will come to the true part and I'll give you a very good example the best example I can give you is Hazrat Umar radiallahu he was the second caliph of Islam he was one of the staunchest enemy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Islam so much so that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did dua to Allah that give hidayah to one of the Umarain out of the two Umar give Hidayah to one and Allah gave Hidayah to Umar bin Khattab and when the person used to hate Islam ready to kill in the name of Islam when he accepted Islam he was one of the staunchest supporters of Islam so I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make you like Hazrat Umar that one who was the staunch enemy of Islam against Daif Inshallah, you will be one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. Inshallah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that once a person accepts Islam, all his or her previous sins are washed away. All the negative is washed. The more bad they did, that much positive they get. That means a person before, he, before accepting Islam, the more evil he did, he was so far away from the deen. When he accepts Islam, that the negative we did all becomes positive means the more you abuse me or Islam inshallah you will get that many positive points after you accept Islam inshallah regarding your main question that how do I when there are many people who are hating me how do I yet do dawah and that's a very good question and when I was new in the field of Dawah many years back when I started preaching, you know, there were few people listening, then became hundred, then became thousand, then hundred thousand, then million. 
So I have to think, okay, first when I started out of 100, 1% you know, was my enemy. So 100 people, 1% enemy, when 1,000, there'll be 10 enemies. When million, 1% of million, 10,000 10, enemies. So yes, my popularity is increasing, and percentage-wise, the enemy is increasing. That was my understanding, which I was wrong. When we do the analysis of the seerah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we come to know that when he started preaching Islam, five of them accepted Islam, there were no enemies. As he kept on growing, spreading the truth, the enemies increased. Today, the person who is the most influential in the world, it is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not only agreed by the Muslims, even by non-Muslims. Michael H. Hart in his book, The Hundred Most Influential People, he puts our Nabi Kari Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as number one. He's a non-Muslim, but puts Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one, most influential human being in the world. Do you know the person against whom the maximum books are written, the person who's criticized most today in the world, who is it? Who is that person? Who is it? Who is the person today in the world who's criticized the most? Who's attacked the most? Who is it? Who is it? Sorry? Can't hear you. Donald Trump, they say. Donald? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. How many books are against him? Today, the person who is the most attacked and hated in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the enemies of Islam, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 31, that to every prophet we have appointed an enemy. And since Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last prophet, he has to have enemies. I told the presence of Arun Shuri in India proves that the Quran is right. If people like Arun Shuri who write books against Islam did not exist in the world, the Quran would be proved wrong. Quran says, for every prophet we have appointed enemy. So then I realized the more you spread the truth and people start liking you, the enemies start hitting you. Alhamdulillah. When I did a little bit of survey in the, in the website, mashallah, the following kept on increasing. It is all because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am nothing. I don't deserve it. Not even 0.001% of it. We started, it increased, and as the MC said, now it is, alhamdulillah, 17.5 million on the Facebook. By Allah's grace, the largest any religious personality, whether Muslim, Christian, or Hindu. The second is a Christian, Joel Oyston, 16.9 million. But when you go on the net, and when I did a survey, out of every 10 websites, at least two websites are against me. Maybe 20%. It's, it may increase. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the followers are 1.8 billion, maybe 2 billion, some non-Muslim loving. But yet, the people hitting him are more today. The books are written against him. And that reminds me of a scholar that you asked me the question, how when people hate you, why it continues. There's a scholar who's, who quoted that Hazrat Umar radiallahu the second caliph of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a sect who cursed Hazrat Umar radiallahu so that he gets sawab. One scholar said the reason Allah created a sect to curse Hazrat Umar radiallahu so that more they curse in the akhira, he will get reward. So in the way Allah is rewarding him, when a person does the haq, the, the word of truth, people speak against him, it will be converted on the day of judgment in his favor. Because anyone who criticizes me speaks against me and it's in the wrong, on the day of judgment, his good deeds will come to me. When his good deeds end, my bad deeds will go to him. So, though I don't want anyone to curse me, but when they curse me, because of the teachings of Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it makes me a stauncher die. And the more you spread, you'll have to get difficulties. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, Surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of lives and goods, and what you have earned or toiled for. 
Allah will test you. Allah will test you with fear and hunger. And we find that more difficult the test, more is the higher reward in the akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, all the ambiyas, all the messengers were tested much more than any other non-messenger in the world. So more difficult the test, higher the reward. And today, I always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever little bit I've done, it is hadha min fazli rabbi. It's only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I left my profession. People told I'm a fool. I left my medicine profession and became a dai. I became from doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. They called me a fool because when I wanted to become a doctor, I thought it was the best profession in the world to, to serve the sick people, it is a good profession, but when I found a better profession of a dai, I gave up my medical profession to become a dai. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me much more than what I could have thought of. I'm sure if I was a doctor, you all wouldn't have come here in Pearl to hear me. They wouldn't have people. We did it for the sake of Allah, Allah gives you multiple times more. And today the problem, because we are spreading the truth, there are people against us. There are people accepting Islam in large numbers, alhamdulillah. Peace TV today, the network has more than 200 million viewers. Every day, hundreds of non-Muslims accepting Islam. This doesn't go down the throat of the enemies of Islam. Whether it be the Western countries, whether it's the country where I was born in India. They don't like it. I like the constitution of my country, India. It is one of the few countries in the world we give the citizen the right to preach, practice and propagate the religion. I did not break a single law of the country, but because I was spreading peace, I was giving solution for humanity. All the people who don't like peace to prevail, they don't like me. So more they strive against me, I'm striving harder to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more difficulties they put to me, thinking that they will, they will maybe make me break down, it is making me a more firm die. Because as Ibn Taymiyyah, you know the many people who attacked him, they threatened him that they will put him in jail and they threatened him that they will kill him, they will exile him. Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam, and I say that I'm nothing, I'm nowhere compared to him. I'm just 0.0001%. And I say the same thing what he said. That what can you do to me? If you put me in jail, I will do zikr of Allah. If you exile me, I will do tafakkur. Contemplate on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you execute me, I will become a shaheed. My jannah is in my heart. They cannot take my jannah away from me. I as a da'i of Islam looks at the seerah of the Prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The more they attacked the Prophet, the Prophet was kind. The Prophet was compassionate. We are no way close to the Prophet. But we as da'i, we cannot retaliate. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with goodness. You may never know who is your enemy, he will become your friend. And you are one of the best examples for the fulfillment of this verse of the Quran. Of Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with goodness, the person who is your enemy will become your friend. And sister, I only follow the glorious Quran and the Sai Hadith to the best of my ability. And the more you follow, because our main goal and my lecture tomorrow, the purpose of our life, you should hear that. What is the purpose of our life? So if your purpose of our life is Akhirah, this dunya is nothing. You strive for the Akhirah, Allah will give you dunya and Akhirah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He make me serve Islam as much as I can, though Allah doesn't require me the rubbish that we are. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may utilize every breath of my life to spread the deen to the best of my ability. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you, Dr. Zake, for everything, and I hope you forgive me. Sister, I've already forgiven you, and I pray for you, and I pray that Allah has more people like you coming close to Islam, inshallah. Can we have the brother on the mic uh, behind? Kindly state your name, your profession, and your question straight to the point. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ahmad Farhan B. Ahmad Sabri. I'm, my profession is stud a student from University of Malaysia Police. Um, from past uh, Dr. Zakir talk, uh, you said that some of the Christian rules are pretty much same with the, our Islamic Sharia. Uh, such as uh, uh, punishment for a thief which is cut their hand my question is why their priests did not want to talk to the to talk to, uh, about this uh, to their followers which is uh, contained contain in the bible thank you brother asked a question that in my speech I said that some of the teachings of Christianity same as Islam for example, cutting the hand, I never said that, brother. I said some of the teachings are the same in all the religions. Not to rob, not to cheat, not to molest a woman, not to rape. I never said that cutting of the hands is there in Christianity. I never said that. I said Islam, besides teaching good things, shows you a way how to achieve that goodness. Just by saying not to rob is not sufficient. It's in every law, every country has its law. It may not be perfect. But the laws, and most of the countries, almost all countries say don't rob. After that what? After that what? Only by saying not rob, will it be sufficient? No. As a deterrent, they have punishment. Some countries will say, if you rob, then one year imprisonment. Some country will say two years. Some country will say three years. In Islam, it says if you rob, and if you fulfill the criteria that you have done all these wrong things, then the punishment is chopping off the hand. So Ramayana chapter 5 verse 38, which is a deterrent. And the makasid of Sharia is not to chop people's hand. It is to make them fearful so that they do not do the crime. So that the problem of the humanity is solved. I never said that Christianity also said that you should chop the hand. That's a misunderstanding. I said most of the religions speak good things. But they do not give a solution how to achieve that goodness. Hope that answers the question. Is that brother uh, in the white in the queue? Yes. Please go ahead. Kindly state your name and profession and your question to the brother. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Muhammad. I'm a student in University of Malaysia, Berlis. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dakir, I want to ask you uh, uh, now uh, there is many of people they affect by Western. Uh, they say Western is better, uh, the strongest, so we have to follow them, uh, follow Western rules. Uh, and uh, also today we, uh, our uh, lecturer is uh, Islam, is the solution. So uh, how can we uh, answer them and tell them Islam is the solution? Especially in political, most of most uh, maybe Muslim uh, uh, secular, they say uh, Islam only in masjid, not in political or all things uh, except only masjid. What we have to say for them? Well, there are two questions. The first question is that today uh, the Western countries are strong, they are powerful, so we have to follow them. How can we say that Islam is the solution? As far as the first question is concerned, brother, I already give the reply that though these countries like USA say they are the most powerful country, it has the maximum number of theft in the world. What is the solution? Would you like to live in a country which has the maximum number of theft? You know, I've been to Western countries, USA several times. Yes, you, uh, you, I know, but uh, you know, uh, you ask me the, the question, strongest. Brother, you ask me the question. Yes, yes. Correct? So if, after I finish the answer, then you can. Oh, okay, okay. The reply I already gave in my talk. I gave the reply in my talk. I've been to USA several times. In most of the cities of USA, it is difficult to travel after midnight for fear that you will be attacked. So, would you like to live in such a country? Out of the statistics that is there in USA, when a woman passes from university, more than 95% have already had a sexual intercost before marriage, 95%. Would you like to stay in such a society? This is what they're trying to portray. This is called woman liberalization. 
I say it is nothing but a degradation of honor, deprivation of a soul, and exploitation of a body. So what they're saying, they advanced, is actually degrading them. We love our sisters, we respect our sisters. So if you follow Islam, Islam has the solution to the problems. If they say that if you see to it that a woman is not raped, is being subjugation, I love my woman to be subjugated. Because I don't like the woman to be raped. This is the reply. Coming to your second question. Coming to your second question. That some of the secular Muslims say that Islam is only meant to be followed in the mosque. These secular Muslims don't know what Islam is. For studying Islam, you have to go back to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And Islam is a deen, a complete way of life. It shows you the solution to all the aspects of life. Mosque is one aspect of ibadah. One aspect. Nowhere does the Quran or the Hadith say that Islam is restricted only to the mosque. Islam is a deen, a complete way of life. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna deena in the al Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Allah says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 25, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the Akhirah, he will be amongst the losers. So Islam is the complete way of life. And the best example is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he led a life as a prophet. He led a life as a statement, as a statesman. He led a life as a politician. Today's politics is dirty. That time, if you want to see, see the seerah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See the lifestyle of the four Khalifa Rashidin. You will come to know what a politician is. So if you want to emulate politics, see the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See the life of the four Khalifa Rashidin. If you want to behave like a good father, look at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the Sahabas. If you want to be a good businessman, look at the Sahaba. So we find in Islam a complete solution. Those people who don't have enough knowledge of Islam, it is lack of knowledge that they say that Islam is restricted to the mosque. It's important. Very important, but it is a complete way of life. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Thank you. Because we don't have much time, if there are sisters, you can kindly stand to the mic. We probably will have uh, one or two more questions uh, after this. So if there are sisters, you can kindly uh, stand and queue in the mic. Uh, meantime, I will proceed with the brother on the front mic. Kindly state your name, your profession, before asking your question, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Usama Rida. Like I'm a degree student, business. Uh, just my question is about salah. You've mentioned and give us uh, knowledge about zakah and how it benefit our society. So what about salah? Why we should gather in the mosque? What is the benefit of it for the community and the society? Thank you. Brother asked the question that in my lecture I gave the example of zakat, what about salah, what is the benefit of salah, why should you go to the mosque and have a congregation and gathering. Brother, I have given a full lecture on salah, the programming towards righteousness. It's for about one and a half, I don't intend doing that. You cannot cover all the points in one lecture. Salah is the second important, the second pillar of Islam. After Tawheed, believing in Allah, that there's no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worthy of worship and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger the second is salah our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the first deed that will be asked you on the day of judgment is the body of salah and according to Imam al-Bahabi not praying falls as the fourth major sin in Islam number one is shirk second is murder third is black magic fourth is foregoing salah it is the fourth major sin in Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume 1 in the book of Salah, that if you pray in Jama'ah, you get 25 times, 27 times more sawab. So praying in Jama'ah is 25 to 27 times better congregation. And there are several hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad There are hadith of Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume 1 in the book of Salah, that the Prophet said that people do not come 
to the mosque for the Juma Salah. He felt like telling one of the Sahaba to lead the Salah so that he would go and burn the houses of those people who did not come for the Juma Salah. There's another hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad said. So based on the scholars, praying Juma Salah is fard. And if you do it for three times without reason, Allah blocks your heart. And according to Imam al-Dhabi, it is the 66th major sin in Islam. Not paying, praying persistently Juma Salah in congregation is the 66th major sin. Imam al-Dhabi also says sin number 65, one sin before that, that persistently not praying in the mosque, in the congregation, Salah with Jama, without a valid reason. There's another hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume 1, book of Salah. The Prophet said, the hypocrites did not come for the Fajr Salah or the Isha Salah. And if they knew the reward, they would come crawling. I felt like telling one of the Sahabas to lead the Salah so that I can go out and burn the homes of the men with them in it who did not come for the congregation Salah. So praying in Jama, the five times Salah, according to very few scholars it is Mustahab Sunnah. Majority scholars say it is Fard. Imam al Dhabi says in his book, in Qabair, it is the 65th major sin that if you do not pray five times Salah in the congregation in the mosque. So most of the scholars agree that you have to pray unless you have a valid reason that if maybe you're traveling or if you're sick. Or normally at the time of the Sahabas, if a person did not come to the mosque to pray, he was either sick or he was a munafik. That's what the Sahaba did. So praying compulsory in the Salah in congregation is a must. What are the various benefits? I can give a talk for one hour only on scientific benefits. Time doesn't permit me, but you can see my video cassette. You come closer to the Muslim Ummah, you get guidance from the Imam, your khushu increases. The best time, the best peace of mind is the time of Salah. And the best part of Salah is the sujood. Allah mentioned sajda and sujood in the Quran 92 times. But if you know what khushu is, you will understand it. You can only enjoy the fruit if you have a taste of it. So if you know what benefit of Salah, one minor benefit, minor benefit I'll tell you. You know, people say, you know, the 10 richest men in the world, and list goes on, Mukesh Ambani, number 10, and Warren Buffett, and number one goes to Bill Gates. Now it is Jeff something. He's overtaken Bill Gates recently. Jeff someone, uh, who's the owner of Amazon. He's overtaken Bill Gates, number one. And there was another post that says, number 10, Ambani, number 3, Bill Gates, number 2, Jeff. Number 1 is who? A Muslim who offers two rakat of sunnah salah before fajr. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that if you pray two rakat sunnah before fajr, it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So if you have a Muslim, you understand that, you will know the reward of that. It's the sunnah salah. Sunnah mawkida. So imagine what would be the reward for the fajr salah. But how many Muslims realize that? Many do, but not all. If you know that, you know, once a businessman approached me, he's a billionaire, you know, but the Zakir, I, I pray four times salah, but I cannot get up for fajr. So I told him, that what if you have a meeting tomorrow, early in the morning, at 5.30, where if the deal clicks, you'll get a billion dollar. He said, I will not sleep the full night. So I told him, you know, the sunnah salah of the fajr is more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. Trillions and zillions of dollars. So if you have that iman, and if you have that faith, then you will realize what important it is. That's what the Prophet said. If the Munafiq knew what was the benefit of coming for the Isha Salah and Fajr Salah to the mosque, they would crawl coming to it. So unfortunately, most of us Muslims don't know the benefit. But Alhamdulillah, I'm happy in Malaysia as compared to India. The percentage of Muslims praying in India is very small in the mosque. I would say less than 5%. But here, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy that the percentage of Muslim men Muslims praying in the mosque is multiple times more than India and Pakistan. 
but as a Muslim the benefit you get the sukoon the serenity the peace it is much more than the wealth so if you know what peace is you will value it if you don't know you won't value it so if a Muslim reads the Quran and the hadith and understand what benefit it is then you will care less for the material things and you will come closer to the deen and you'll find the benefit for more details refer to my talk Salah the program into the righteousness hope that answers the question unfortunately we have come to the last question of the day and last two is there okay okay so can we have the brother uh, on the mind mic behind yes please go ahead state your name your profession and ask your question assalamu alaikum uh, dr zakir uh, my name is mohammad niza i just recently graduated from medical college uh, so my question is uh, regarding um, the haram about touching the dog so when i listen to your answer the saliva is haram pro probably due to the rabies uh, you said about hydrophobia so now recently we know there is vaccine uh, produced against rabies so what is your answer to it but that the question that I gave one of the reasons that why we should not uh, touch the dog and I said that licks the body and one of the reasons that can be the, the reason not given the hadith and I gave that the saliva has certain germs and rabies etc he being a doctor I said that now we have a rabies vaccine you know so what is your reply brother when you jump from the second floor what will happen you fracture your leg you go to the hospital you have treatment for the fractured leg will you jump from the second floor no why you're a doctor will you die chances are less second floor you won't die but you'll break a bone so will you jump no or you can go to the prostitute maybe you'll get std is there treatment for std no. std sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea treatment yes. is there not aids yes yes will you go no if no. you have diabetes okay we'll give you insulin will you have extra sugar prevention is better than cure you're a doctor yes. i'm also a doctor sure. so will you tell your doctor oh, do everything i'm a doctor i will give you injection so when the when the patient comes with rabies no problem go to the doc take more bites i will keep on giving you injection what will the patient tell you what will the patient tell you? you're a good doctor patient will tell you the doctor wants to make money therefore he's telling okay so prevention is better than cure so in islam is the solution the solution is stay away from it don't take vaccine why you want to get injected with the disease and then take a medicine best is prevention is better than cure hope that answers the question thank you Dr. unfortunately this will be the last question of the day brother can you keep your question as short as possible thank you um, uh, actually just now I didn't mention my name and my profession I am actually my name is Hassan and my profession is I'm just a postman I'm nothing to be a proud of and nothing to be ashamed of and um, my question is uh, brother my respected brother Zakir uh, you in Torah we have this uh, punishment of uh, adultery is stoned to death but when it comes to Quran the punishment is not stoned to death it is mentioned weeping hundred times or uh, maybe caning yeah hundred times but at the same time what I am telling you is strengthened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that وَمَا يَنْتِكُوا أَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُّ يُوْهَا He does not speak of his own desire but whatsoever that I reveal to him through inspiration that he convey. So Allah says weeping. So how does this stone to death come in? That's my question. The brother asked a very good question. He said that if you read the Bible in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures we come to know that for adultery it is the punishment flowing to death. 
in Islam, if you read the Quran, it says that there is hundred lashes. So where does the flow into death come? What you are referring to, uh, brother, if you read the punishment for zina, there are various verses in the Quran talking about it. One verse in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 1, says that when they are involved in zina, zina is of two types, adultery and fornication. Fornication means an illegal sexual intercourse before marriage. Adultery is an illegal sexual intercourse after marriage. Different between the two. It says that keep her in seclusion in a home until that takes place or until Allah gives something else. That means there's a punishment mentioned, but there's a clause. Unless Allah gives another punishment. If you read Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4 says that if you're involved in fornication, 100 lashes. Now this zina word, the Mufassirin have translated as fornication. Means illegal sexual intercourse before marriage. But in the hadith it says about adultery. So the punishment for adultery, illegal sexual intercourse after marriage is turning to death. So there are two different things. Illegal sexual intercourse before marriage is fornication, the word English. It is 100 lashes. But illegal sexual, sexual intercourse after marriage is a bigger sin. Because besides doing the sin, you are betraying your wife. That's why the punishment is thrown into that that is given in various hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So both are not contradicting. There are different punishments for two different acts which come under the category of zina. Hope that answers the question. Actually, uh, there is an addition. There are some scholars, well-known scholars, uh, they say that they don't agree with stoning to death. They say they only abide by what is written by Allah. The punishment is lashes, hundred lashes. You they say, no, it is found in the Hadith and it is practiced by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, if you don't find the punishment in Quran, then you go to Hadith. But if the punishment is in the Quran, don't go to Hadith. Brother, so, said, Soran is superior than Hadith. Brother, I said that he knows some scholars who say that if the punishment is in the Quran, you don't have to go to Hadith. Brother, what you call scholars are not scholars. It's like me telling you, my mathematics teacher told me in my school 2 plus is equal to 5. Will you ask me what is the degree of the teacher? If I tell you, my mathematics teacher in my school, he's a great mathematician. He's told 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. What will you tell me? Brother, who you are telling a mathematician is not a mathematician. Why? Because you know maths. Brother, are you listening to me? Because you know maths, you will say, what Dr. Zakir is saying nonsense. How can a mathematician scholar say 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? Similarly, I, having little knowledge of Islam, scholars who say that if it's given in the Quran, no need of going in the Hadith and turning to the not there. He's not a scholar at all. I don't want to ask his name also. It will surely not be amongst the well-known scholars. It will be those who don't have knowledge of Islam. And people who have less knowledge may be considering themselves to be a scholar. Some people say Salman Rajdi scholar, Tasliman Rasid scholar, for you, not for me. So these scholars who say, what is the ruling of the Quran and Hadith is when you want to know about Islam, number one is Quran, then is Hadith. I agree, there's no two doubt about it. But the Hadith will never contradict the Quran. No say Hadith will contradict the Quran. And the Quran is a telegraphic message. Quran says pray. How to pray does it mention? It may tell you about Qayyam, about Sujood. Does it say how many, how many raka to pray in Fajr? Does it say? How many raka to pray in Zohar? Does it say? No. Certain things it says, but not everything. More details go to the Hadith. So similarly, no say Hadith will contradict with the Quran. So many things in the Quran, the Quranic works itself is sufficient. Quran says give zakat. How much to give zakat does it say in the Quran? Nowhere does the Quran says give 2.5 percent. What are you going to do? Go on to the hadith. So here when we find that there is a hadith which apparently for you and a normal person may think it's a contradiction, the scholars see the ruling and then they come with a solution. If the hadith contradicts the Quran, it cannot be a say hadith. But many a time the hadith doesn't contradict, it gives more information. So when the hadith is sahih, it will never contradict the Quran, it's giving more information. So when we have to derive a, a compromise between the Quran and hadith, we have to see to it and then the scholars give a solution. Because our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul. If Allah said only follow 
Allah, then Rasul wasn't required. What does Allah say? Atiyu Allah, Atiyu Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 59, Obey Allah, obey the Messenger and those who have been endowed with knowledge, all, all Amr. Those who have knowledge. But it continues, but with those with knowledge, if they differ, you go back to Allah and His Rasul. So if it's a Sahih Hadith, it will never contradict the Quran. Like the answer I gave you, it's not contradicting. Now that person who you call a scholar may not be knowing the difference between fornication and adultery. What am I going to do? I don't want to ask them of the scholar also. Will you ask me, who is the scholar who says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? If I tell you the name, will you believe? <coughs> what will you say? That person is not a scholar. So similarly, those who say that once it's given in the Quran, it cannot... One is given in the Quran, yes. If the Quran says pray, why are you going to the Hadith? Hadith gives more details. Do you understand? So when Hadith gives more details, you have to follow Allah and His Rasul both. You cannot say only follow the Quran. If you follow only the Quran, many things of Islam you cannot do. So as a whole, as a Muslim, even in my talk I said, Allah and His Rasul. The glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith. Hope that answers the question. So final, 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 final. I just want to clarify but as you say in the Quran it's not mentioned two rakat, three, five, four. No, it's not mentioned. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will show us as the guidance how to pray uh, Fajr, Lohar, Asar and all that. Yeah, I agree. But here it's clearly mentioned hundred lashes. You know, Allah says it's hundred. So if if some Brother, countries... did you hear my answer? Minute, no, no. I'm if up, some wait, country, wait, wait, wait. I'm no, sir. I'm one minute. Telling, did you I, hear, I just finish did, it. Did you... If one country... Let's not, practice, waste, let's not waste the time. No, no. no there it, are one two, minute. There are two types of zina. Can you repeat which two types of zina are there? Can you repeat? Two penalties. Two types of zina. Zina. Okay. What are the two types of zina I mentioned? Fornication and another three. Ah, what is the punishment for fornication? For fornication is hundred lashes. Where it is mentioned? It's not. Uh, it's mentioned in the Quran. The punishment for adultery. Where it is mentioned? It's not mentioned at all. It is mentioned in the Hadith. Yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> it's mentioned in the Hadith and also mentioned in the Quran. Yeah. You forgot. The Quran says, "Put her into a confinement in the room until Allah gives another punishment." Ambiguous. Allah gives another punishment. It's ambiguous. Through, <laughs> not ambiguous. Another punishment Allah gives through Anabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not ambiguous. That means the Quran is saying one more punishment is going to come. But you don't want to read the hadith. Who's to blame? You or Allah? You. So when you read the hadith, you come to know more details. So we as Muslims should follow Quran and Sunnah both together. Quran is number one. Then is hadith. No hadith will contradict the Quran. It is your lack of knowledge and lack of understanding. So if Quran says, if you don't know, fas'alu al zikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. So if you don't know, you have to ask a scholar. When you get sick, who do you go to? Do you go to a barber? Do you go to a cobbler? No. Who do you go to? Who do you go to? When, when I... When you're sick, when you're sick, who do you go to? Doctor. Doctor, not to a barber. <laughs> so when you don't know about Quran, go to a scholar, not fake scholar. Don't go to a quack. To a scholar who has knowledge of the Quran and Sayyidi, then inshallah will get the reply. Hope that answers the inshallah. question. Wa akhirud dawan alhamdulillah bil alamin.